our speaker series. Um, it is only about 12.01, so um, we'll probably get going in about one minute. Um, but what I'll ask you is to um, please make sure that you're muted and to turn off your video. Um, this helps one just so that um, we can hear the speakers and as well kind of saves um, uh, bandwidth so that um, we don't have uh, as many technical problems as could be. So uh, just hang in there with us and we'll get started in uh, one minute. Um, in less than one, we have most of the people here. So let's get started. So again, um, uh, welcome to the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance Knowledge in November Speaker Series. Um, my name is Leah Congshard. I'm the Executive Director here at NSWA. And we're very excited to try out this new uh, method of uh, speaker series. Um, for many of you who have come to our educational forums before, typically we have in-person educational events twice a year, February and October. But like many of you, we are kind of adapting to the changing times and we're quite excited about sharing doing this. So every Tuesday in November at lunchtime, we're gonna be having um, a series of speakers to chat about activities that are going on in the watershed. So to date, uh, we have over 90 people signed up for the entire series of the month. So that's really quite exciting. So that's very similar to the number of people we get for our in-person um, uh, educational series. Now, if you happen to know somebody who might be interested in the series, please just check out our uh, NSWA website. On our homepage, right at the bottom, there's a section called What's On, and uh, it's located right under there. So. With that, just some housekeeping to get started. So again, please don't use your video and keep your microphone unmuted. Um, this again, just helps with the bandwidth and the technical issues. If you do have a question when the uh, speakers are um, doing their presentations, please use the chat feature. And you can find that at the bottom of your Zoom page. So if you just scroll down to the bottom and it'll pop up with a little menu and there'll be a small box that says chat. If you click on that, a window should open. And in there, you can just type a question and we have NSWA staff who will be monitoring that. And at the end of the presentation, we will be um, answering uh, some of the questions or addressing as many as we can in the time period we have. And yes, definitely the presentations are going to be posted on our website when we're done. Now, uh, we do have um, two speakers today, and one of them is uh, quite in a quite rural remote location. So if we do happen to have um, technical difficulties, just bear with us. We have a couple plan, uh, backup plans uh, to make sure that we can get the presentation done. So. Um, with that, the theme of our Knowledge in November series is 20 years of partnerships in watershed planning. And this was also um, the theme for our educational forum in February. And this is done in celebration of NSWA's uh, 20th anniversary. So NSWA became a nonprofit uh, society in 2000. And then in 2005, we were made a designated watershed planning and advisory council uh, in Alberta. So 20 years of uh, watershed excellence could not have happened without our partners. And so that's why we wanna celebrate, especially our partnerships and the progress we've made in 20 years. And to highlight some of these partnerships, NSWA asked some of our key st stakeholders um, why watershed planning was important to them and as well, what their partnership with NSWA meant to them. So we've compiled a short video in celebration of our partners and our anniversary, and we're having the world premiere in this series. So if you just hang on, I'm gonna show you our short two minute video on our partners. Here she goes. Water is the lifeblood of our land, whether it is for industrial use, agriculture, recreation, or just safe, sustainable drinking water. It's important that we, through groups like NSWA, do our best to manage those for all the stakeholders that live and play along this river. 
the river is integral for aquatic ecosystem health. Without a healthy river, fish and other real key species are going to be uh, suffering. If we don't care for watersheds, then we, we can't expect all the public benefits. We rely on the scientists and people that have the knowledge, the background as to what uh, are the best practices for our river and our lands. We all are part of the watershed, so we have to be very aware moving forward of the actions of the everyday residents, but also the businesses and the stakeholders that are within the communities of the watershed. We use the water, but we have an impact on the water, so we have some responsibility on the river and the watershed itself. Of course, as a water utility, even before it reaches the intake of the water treatment plants, we want to make sure that we have the best water possible. It can be hard to do that without an organization like the NFL anyway. Personally, I feel like every time I take a drink of water, um, I'm grateful for their work. I would say to anybody, please do get involved. We all need to be coming together to do our part. You will learn more. You will meet some incredible people that are dedicated. It's starting to provide that science-based knowledge that helps us make good decisions within the watershed. And that's truly important if we want to make an appropriate use of this water. So that was our uh, celebratory uh, NSWA 20th anniversary uh, video. Um, very excited to share that on our website and other media coming up. And a big thank you to our partners who really, you know, um, provided, you know, the answers and the visuals and, and some really moving um, testimonials about um, why watershed planning is important. So very proud of that, very excited. So our Knowledge in November series, our very first speaker, uh, speakers are presenting on the Watershed Monitoring Project, which is a multi-stakeholder monitoring initiative that involves the Alberta government, EPCOR, NSWA, and the City of Edmonton. And our presenters today are Christina Wandia and Steph Newfield. Uh, Christina is from uh, Alberta Environment, and she's an aquatic scientist, and she's in the Resource Stewardship Division of Environment and Parks. Uh, she's worked in the academic sector in Europe, focusing on watershed management and sediment transport in regulated rivers. In Alberta, Christina has worked with the NSWA, evaluating climate change and licen licensing effects in the Sturgeon River and assessing lake levels in uh, Alberta. She is now one of the scientists working on the watershed monitoring program in the North Saskatchewan River. Steph Newfield uh, has been a watershed manager with EPCOR since 2008, where her focus is on drinking water, source protection, and managing cumulative effects of EPCOR's operations on the North Saskatchewan River. Steph completed her bachelor's and master's in environmental ecology at the University of Alberta. After graduation, she worked as a consulting consultant as an aquatic biologist for several years before starting her career with EPCOR. Steph has taken on many board positions, including being the president of the Alberta Lake Management Society, as well as being on the board of the directors for the Alberta Water Council. Steph has also sat on the Integrated Watershed Management Plan Steering Committee for the North Saskatchewan uh, Watershed Alliance for three years, and has worked on many other watershed planning projects in Alberta and BC. One of her work highlights is spearheading the North Saskatchewan River Watershed Monitoring Program. And so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, let Christina and Stephanie uh, make their presentation. Okay, well, thanks, thanks, Leah. Uh, let's see if I can uh, make this work. Um, Okay, gonna start. 
the presentation. So can everyone see the first slide? Yep. Excellent. All right. Well, first of all, uh, thanks everyone for for attending this seminar. So today, Steph and I will will introduce the watershed monitoring program. I will present first the story of the program, uh, the main objectives and implementation, what type of data we are collecting and how it can be accessed. And then Steph will continue the presentation talking about some preliminary results uh, and also how we can use uh, the data that we are collecting. So everyone knows the NSR is one of the Alberta's major systems. It originates in the Columbia ice fields, where it receives meltwater from the Saskatchewan glacier, and it that flows east across Alberta towards Saskatchewan. It occupies about 9% of the province, and it provides resources, services, and also recreational opportunities to about one third of Albertans. Uh, the NSR has a very rich terrestrial and aquatic biodiversity, and it's also the source of drinking water in, in Edmonton. So the relevance of the NSR and, and the importance of, of protecting it, it's, it's reflected in the number of management and other watershed initiatives that exist in the basin. So for example, the NSWA developed the Integrated Watershed Management Plan in 2012. The city of Edmonton developed the River for Life strategy to address water quality improvements in the river. EPCOR also has their source water protection plan, and AEP is implementing the water management framework for the industrial heartland and capital region, and it's also developing the North Saskatchewan regional plan. So despite all this number of initiatives promoting a sustainable development in the basin, there, is, there are still some uh, knowledge gaps uh, that are required to implement these successful uh, management strategies. So all these knowledge gaps were translated into monitoring needs uh, by the steering committee, which is formed by members of AP, EPCOR, the NSWA, and the city of Edmonton. And there were several broad themes that were consistent across these groups, including, first of all, the identification of point and non-point pollution sources, the quantification of sediment, nutrient, and contaminant delivery from the tributaries, impacts of climate change and assessment of the risks to water quality and water supplies, um, the regular evaluation of aquatic ecosystem health and water quality changes in the NSR, not only the main stem, but also in the tributaries, and also an increased monitoring to support the implementation of management frameworks in, in the basin. So overall, these gaps and these monitoring needs highlighted the, the need for a comprehensive and sustainably funded monitoring program in, in the basin. So even though it's been fully implemented relatively recently, this program is, is not new. And actually, conversations have been taking place since 2010, when the NSWA formed a water quality working group and highlighted the need of a watershed scale monitoring program. It was not until 2016 that EPCOR put forward the funding request, which was finally approved and supported by the city of Edmonton. Then in 2018, we had the design of the monitoring network. And finally in 2019, the network was finalized and monitoring was commenced. So this program, as we have seen, is quite a unique collaboration between AP, EPCOR, the NSWA and the city of Edmonton. And the program scope and the implementation is governed by a steering committee with representation from these four organizations. And this model ensures that the monitoring data generated serves multiple purposes and also adapts to changing priorities across, across the basin. So in terms of funding, the program receives support uh, up to 1 million per year from the city of Edmonton water rate payers. And the program was originally designed for four years with possible renewal. And then there are also additional scientific and, and technical in-kind support provided by AP, uh, by the Resource Stewardship Division in particular. And there are currently three scientists and four monitoring staff working, working on the program. So this uh, watershed program is integrated within AP's core river water quality and quantity program. And this core program are basically two. The first one is the Long-Term River Network, or the LTRN, 
And the second one is the Tributary Monitoring Network or TMN. And these two programs are defined by the regular collection of water quality from major Alberta rivers. So the LTRN sites are located in the main stem of the major rivers in Alberta, while the TMN sites are located in the main tributaries of these major systems. And the objective is to augment this data generated from the LTRNs. Um, the intent of the watershed program in the NSR is to enhance the monitoring at existing LTRN sites, but also implement a tributary monitoring network to evaluate the inputs from the tributaries. And this monitoring design is based around a mass balance approach, which basically means that the water quality has to be paired with water quantity or flow data. And this will allow the calculation of budgets and fluxes uh, for the substances of interest. So in terms of the monitoring network design, a couple of years ago, John Orwin, who is the director of Watershed Sciences with AP, uh, he applied a geospatial and a statistical approach to characterize and classify the subwatersheds within the, the NSR. This methodology followed a hydrological response unit approach. And this method, uh, very briefly, basically assumes that these subwatersheds with similar physical characteristics, such as geology, land cover, slope, or wetlands, uh, will show a similar hydrological response and therefore will be put together in the cluster analysis or in the statistical analysis. Then once we have uh, the subwatersheds classified by these physical characteristics, we pick up uh, a number of representative subwatersheds from each of these groups. So we ended up with a selection of 19 sites across the basin. We see here the, the, road, the red uh, dots are the, the tributary monitoring network, while the, the yellow squares in the main stem are the long-term uh, river network sites. Uh, the watershed network is the red, the red dots. So 12 of these sites were uh, already had an existing hydrometric station, so we only had to add the water quality monitoring at these sites. Where there are seven of these sites, these are the ones that are highlighted with the red square. These were completely new and unmonitored, and therefore we had to add both the hydrometric station to measure flows and also the water quality sample. This, is the, this network uh, is, is being expanded. So in the next uh, years, we are going to have a new station in the Klein, a new station in the Klein River, which is in the headwaters. It drains into Abraham Lake. And we will also install a monitor, a meteorological station uh, in the White Rabbit Creek area, very close to the sea flare, also in the headwaters. Uh, we are planning on installing as well a flow monitoring station at Pakan. This is a station in the main stem, and it's part of the long-term river uh, network. So we have historical water quality data for this site, but we don't have flow data. So that's why we are adding uh, this hydrometric station in, in this site. So the program is structured into main um, monitoring or studies. So the first one is the core monitoring, which is basically the collection of flow and water quality data at all of these sites that we have seen in, in these maps, and also regular assessment of aquatic ecosystem health. But then we also have focused studies, which are more like short-term research projects. And the objective of these focused studies is fill information gaps that we notice and also develop on or assess new methods or compare these um, more recent methods with past uh, methodologies. So we are gonna have a look now uh, at the core monitoring. So as I have mentioned before, the monitoring is based on a, a mass loading approach, meaning that at each side, we are monitoring for both water quality and water quantity which will allow to calculate budgets for uh, the substances. So at each site, we have continuous flow data monitored, monitored by a flow station, like the one that we see here in the photo. This one in particular is uh, located in the sea flare in, in the headwaters. And we also have water quality data measured using a combination of discrete or grab samples and continuous water quality zones. So SONS provide continuous water quality data uh, for a general but important parameters, for example, water temperature, conductivity, pH, 
turbidity and dissolved oxygen. While grab samples allows for the measurement of a larger suite of water quality parameters when samples are sent to a certified lab. And in this case, uh, uh, with these samples, we have information for major ions, nutrients, trace metals, chlorophyll A, E. coli, and isotopes. So the grab samples are collected at a monthly frequency, but during the spring fresh shed, we increase this frequency, the sampling frequency, up to three samples per month. So in addition to the flow and the water quality sampling, most of the sites are also equipped with cameras. And these ones provide daily images of the sites via satellite connection. And this information is quite useful, for example, to help uh, correct for flow measurements, monitor flow increases during rainfall events, and also determine ice breakup dates. So here I put some photos from these cameras, the clear water and Nordic in the headwaters, and the Sturgeon and the Vermilion River uh, downstream. So how to access this data? So all the flow data and also the photos from the cameras are available in the Rivers Alberta website. I put the link here. Uh, and the water quality data can be accessed as well, but via request. So I put here a link that uh, will lead you to the website where you will see all the information and all the steps to request the water quality data for this program. So in terms of the couple of years for which we have data, this slide is showing in particular the flow data for 19, 2019 and 2020. And flows have been quite uh, above the average. So in this case, in this slide, we see the flows in the NSR at Edmonton. And this is showing the flows from 1980 to 2020. And the red line is showing the mean uh, discharge for this period. And we see that both the last couple of years have been quite wet. And if we look at the monthly distribution of this flow, which is in this graph here, uh, the gray background area is the average, the monthly average. The blue bars is the discharge for 2019 and the yellow one for 2020. And we see that particularly the period between May and July has been quite wet and quite above this, uh, this historical average. So this is another example. In this case, this is the Vermilion River, and this is farther downstream. This is a new station, and we don't have historical data for this point uh, yet. So these parts are showing the discharge for 2019 and 2020. And again, we see that 2020 was quite wet, more than 2019. And thanks to the cameras that uh, we have seen before, we witnessed quite an impressive event. Uh, basically, we captured this this peak here, and something happened in, in the basin. So let's see if we can reproduce the, the video. So basically, there was this flat event in mid-April, and it basically just took the bridge uh, away. So it basically gives you an idea that these uh, cameras are not only providing valuable environmental information, but it can also be used for educational and outreach. Uh, purposes. So in terms of the graph samples, the discrete sampling, these graphs are showing the number of samples that we have collected during the program. So in 2019, we collected almost 220 samples. And in 2020, this number is, is a bit less, particularly because we had to pause the program uh, between March and, and May. It was resumed again in June. Uh, but we missed the spring fresh air due to the, to the beginning of, of the pandemic. So this diagram is showing uh, the frequency of samples collected uh, for every month. And we see this increase in the frequency during the spring fresh air. And we see also the gap uh, between March and June for the samples for 2020, which would be the light blue bars here that are, that are missing. So just from here, a big thanks to all our technicians who are working rain or shine, collecting all, all the samples across, across the basin. Uh, so these graphs here are showing the, the hydrograph for two of our tributaries. The first one is the Ram in the headwaters and Strawberry, uh, which is farther downstream, upstream of the city of Edmonton. And the blue dots are the days for which we have water quality samples. So we have uh, quite a good coverage of, of flow conditions here for a Strawberry 
for example, uh, we lost uh, some of the peak events. And this is the data for 2020. And we see again this gap during the spring freshet uh, due to the beginning of, of the pandemic. But even though we have missed some of these uh, peak events, if we look at the flow distribution, even with just two years of data, we have a, quite a good coverage. Um, so these curves are the flow duration curves, and they are basically uh, showing the amount of time that a specific discharge is equal or exceeded. So for example, if we want to look at the median flows, which are equal or exceeded 50% of the time, we should go to here 50, and this would, would give us the median flow. So this is for the RAM, and this is for, for the strawberry for a strawberry creek. Um, so all the flows that are equal or exceeded uh, 20 or less percent of the time are considered high flows, whereas this is the low flow range and these are mid range flows. Um, so after the two years of, of the program, we already have quite a good coverage. These dots are showing which discharge have data, have water quality data. So we have quite a good coverage for high and mid range flow at both basins, but we still see that we are missing some of the, of the low flow range. So hopefully in the next few years, we'll be able to fill these, these gaps. So this diagram is showing the sound uh, data. So this is, this is showing uh, the time for which we have the sounds deployed at each of these, of these basins. So you see that some of the headwater sites have uh, Data, uh, data sounds deployed uh, in the winter, but some of them are only seasonal and some of them only have data between March and October during the open water season. And this is basically because only the sites in the headwaters have enough uh, flow conditions for sun, sun deployment. And this year, again, the, the thing is that we missed uh, some months uh, for here because of the, the beginning of the pandemic. So these graphs are showing uh, an example of the SON data that we that we have. So and basically you can already see the response of the watershed to precipitation events. So the blue lines are indicating the hydrograph and the brown yellow lines are changes in turbidity. And this is for RAM and this is for the Strawberry Creek again. So what can we do with this data? So basically we can start uh, looking at relationships between turbidity, which is collected with the sun data and suspended sediment concentrations, which are collected using the grab samples. So if we obtain a relationship between these two parameters, we can start calculating budgets of substances. In this case, we can start calculating budgets for uh, suspended sediment, even though it's a good idea to have more data to fill uh, some, some of the gaps, but it will take a little bit of time. So the last part of the, of the core program, which I have mentioned before, is the regular assessment of aquatic ecosystem health. So these maps are showing all the sites along the NSR where we have historical data of aquatic ecosystem health, starting in around the 70s. So at the beginning, all the, all the historical surveys were done in the vicinity of the city of Edmonton. And it was not until the 80s that we have the first watershed scale uh, assessment from the mountains to the border uh, with, with Saskatchewan. Um, so the last survey was done in 2015. So last year, four years after this, this last survey, um, we did another to add to the historical data set. So we selected 17 sites along the main stem with historical data, and we collected benthic invertebrates, perifyton, water quality, and also sediment quality. And the objective is uh, to add this, uh, this assessment to the historical data and see how communities have changed. So we are currently looking at, at this data and hopefully at the next forum, we'll be able to present some of these, some of these results. So I'm just gonna to touch on the focused studies that uh, we are working on. So basically we have three main focused studies uh, at the moment. So the first one is aiming at quantifying the nature concentration and export of dissolved organic matter or DOM from tributaries draining contrasting land covers. So basically an agricultural tributaries versus a forested uh, tributary. 
So DOM is a common constituent in, in surface water, but in high concentration, it can pose challenges to water treatment plants as it can produce taste and, and other problems. So the idea is to deploy a dissolved organic matter sensor like the one we have here in, in the photo and also increase the sampling frequency with an automatic sampler, which is the photo that we have on, on the left. So the idea is to understand the sources and the dynamics of dissolved organic matter and see if we can use these sensors uh, as an early warning system of color events at the treatment plants. So the second focused study that we have is a method comparison. Uh, so in all historical assessments of aquatic ecosystem health in the NSR, the method used has been the needle cylinder, which is basically a cylinder that you insert in the substrate of the river, and then the substrate is agitated with a shovel and all the benthic invertebrates and debris is washed into the net. Uh, however, we would like to start using the calving protocol, which has been introduced as the standard sampling protocol across uh, Canada. And it has also been applied successfully in the, in the Athabasca River. So instead of using this nail cylinder, uh, the calving protocol uses a metallic frame with a net, and then the sampler kicks his feet, and all the benthic invertebrates are washed into the net and collected in the cup. Um, so the objective of this focused study is basically to compare both methodologies and how we can use cabin to compare the data that we obtained with this method uh, with the historical data that was using the nil cylinder. So basically compare uh, both methodologies to see to what extent we can combine both types of data. So the last um, focused study that we are doing is basically using a flow, flow targeted sampling or flow weighted sampling to update and set uh, maximum allowable loads or MALs in the river. And this is to support the implementation of the industrial heartland and capital region water management frameworks. Uh, these loads or objectives will be set for different flow ranges as the ones that we have here in the figure. So we are uh, targeting from high flows to, to low flows. And the goal is basically maintain or improve the ambient loads of the identified parameters of concern. So this work is led, is led by AP's resource management team. And if you have any question, you can contact Vanessa Swerbrick. I put he, her contact information there. So, so far we can, we can say that uh, this monitoring program has been a success. Uh, all the stakeholders in the basin working towards the same, the same objective. And we also had last year the minister doing a media release and supporting the program. Maybe you saw that on, on the news. I put here some, some photos of that day. And we also have some challenges as well because some of the stations have been vandalized and, and also some of the creeks. We see that the, we, have, we have seen the construction of some, some beaver dams uh, which have affected the, the, the hydrological response of, of the tributaries, but this is just part of, of the landscape. And also the fact that things take time. So for example, um, some of the new stations uh, don't have flow data yet. So once you install the hydrometric station, it takes a bit of time to be able to develop these level discharge uh, relationships. So for example, I've put here a couple of, of the new stations. So we see that we, we need more manual flow measurements to be able to uh, develop this curve and therefore translate the, the level water to, to this charge. Well, so with this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here uh, and give the floor to, to Steph. Um, I cannot stay until the end of the presentation, but if anyone has any, any question, I've put my contact information at the beginning, so I, people are more than welcome to, to send me an email with questions. So that's it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Christina, and we'll queue up Stephanie right away. All right, can you hear me? You bet. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so though it looked like Christina was in outer space, I'm actually the remote one, so I may be cutting in and out. Um, so just bear with me and uh, 
I might just ask if you can maybe just mention if you can't hear me. Um, so I'm switching gears a little bit um, in terms of Christina's uh, uh, summary. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of summarize kind of where we're where we've been and, and where we where we're we're going and then talk a little bit about how we could use some of this data that um, that is being collected as part of this watershed program. So in, in 2008, I joined EPCOR and in 2009, we uh, published a source water protection was analyzing um, water quality at the, at the intakes of our water treatment plants. And the concept then was for me coming from my background in aquatic science was, okay, well, where's all, where's all this coming from? If color is an issue, if turbidity is an issue or TSS is an issue, where is it coming from in the watershed? If I'm standing on the North Saskatchewan um, River, you know, on a bridge in Edmonton, can I partition those loads up to the watershed during and where management actions could be positive on the landscape to try to manage these manage these loads or at least maintain them in the future um, so that we, we know what's going to be coming uh, down the river in different seasons um, and, and through different land use changes and with climate and the answer was is that I, I couldn't do it and I couldn't do it because there was a paucity of data in the upper watershed um, you know uh, the Clearwater River at that time throughout the entire history so with the 50 years before 12 samples and when you look at Christina's graphs and you think well look water quality is so variable and flow is so variable and if you capture only 12 samples um, uh, you miss uh, most of the water watershed processes and now we have a really good understanding it's the headwaters it's what drives the flow in in the city of Edmonton and in oftentimes drives the water quality in the city of Edmonton and we really didn't have good data on there so if I go back to my files in 2010 I have a file called developing a watershed monitoring program for um for the North Saskatchewan Basin and we started a group in the NSWA at that time and we talk a little bit about partnerships. And so we had that water quality monitor figure out how we are going to pay for this and get a sustainable funding formula for, for watershed uh, monitoring so that we could meet the needs of the stakeholders. And that was in 2010. And it wasn't until really 2018 and 2019, almost, almost a decade later that we got this program going. And that's a testament to you know, the fact that when you work in partnership, it can be sometimes a little bit more difficult and a little bit more um, longer timelines. But I think the, 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 the strength is, is that you develop a more solid foundation and a longer term project than if you would just go out and do it yourself. And for years, we would, we would sample, EPCOR would sample some watersheds, um, different groups would sample different aspects of the watershed. Uh, Clearwater Land Care would look at some uh, 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 tributary, uh, uh, tributary data upstream and we didn't have a comprehensive wa uh, water watershed program and data for the headwater areas and at the same time when we were capturing data we were missing other aspects so we would capture it at the lower agriculture we in the general sense of the word we we would capture it at the lower agricultural tributaries largely part of the ASA and CASA program but we would miss those same events and uh, um, uh, as Christina has shown in her slides, precipitation, which drives uh, watershed processes and water quality, um, is variable year to year. And in, so if you, in the case in ASA study, we, it was really a 10 year um, dry period. And so it may be telling you a different story than when you have a water, watersheds that are flushing. Um, and at that time, there was no samples taken that on the up watersheds where most of the water was coming from. So it was a really hard thing to do um, in 2009 to update a source water protection plan with really a lack of lack of data and a lack of paired flow data. Um, so this mass balance approach will allow us uh, and watershed processes a little bit better. So I'm just... So if we look at um, in just the since 
2019 and, and one and a half years of watershed monitoring, um, we have about uh, we we're starting to we're starting to add to those upper upper tributary in terms of the number of samples and um, particularly for some parameters that were maybe off, off the radar before. And this is, has to do with the fact that color isn't maybe a concern from an aquatic biologist person from uh, the perspective of a water treatment plant. So without those partnerships and calm potentially be missed and that, that one hear me? Hello? Hello? You're, you're going in and out, Steph, yeah. but we can still hear you. Keep going. Okay. Yeah, it, I, a little thing came up, said that my internet connection was unstable. So it should be okay now. Um, all right. So in 1.5 years, um, that's, we've managed to capture 14% of the sampling events since 1975. And by the end of 2021, 20, 25% of the sampling events will be from the watershed program. So that's an incredible um, jump in, in uh, the ability to capture the variability in these watersheds and better understand what drives them. And once you understand how watersheds work, what drives them, how precipitation patterns and land use, you can start to make management decisions that are a little bit more specific and a little bit more targeted so that we can make sure that the resource is managed appropriately and, and protected and that uh, we're focusing on the right areas. So I'm just gonna uh, take you through four slides now just and the the one of the great things about the watershed program is that the data for so many different aspects. And so I can show you slides that are important in my um, uh, uh, focus on target areas or management areas, but really it, it's each of us taking those data apart and understanding the, the watershed science behind it. What is driving water quality and quantity in these watersheds? Um, and so for me to just present a few, the, the uh, ability of this program to inform um, our understanding uh, over the long term. So by looking at some of this data, it allows us to set a baseline for development um, and, and say, okay, this is what the streams look like now. Um, we don't know where we've come from, but if we can understand those processes enough, we can potentially model back into the future and look at what the base understanding of where we've been, where we're going and where we want to be. And so uh, it allows us to then work through the system um, and, and uh, potentially set uh, targets, um, maximum allowable loads, even up to the tributaries and say, okay, well, we know what the baseline data it is let's try to get there let's try to restore these streams or you know a watershed groups can start to set objectives and outcomes and you can't do that if you don't have good water quality data and you can't understand what the drivers are in your particular sub watershed unless you have that good water quality data then you can start to pair it to some of the um, pressures in that landscape which are very variable and very different and, and Christina showed a slide about beavers and you know that's just one of those factors that all compound to um, uh, uh, be a, a watershed process that we need to understand how that affects water quality um, in the long term and so you really need data flow data water quality data under all those sorts of conditions to understand the science and then once you understand the science you can sort of again determine those areas for priority management so often when people ask well now you've got this watershed data How's, how are our streams doing? Are they good? Are they bad? And that's an entire different, uh, uh, different kind of subject area because we really um, don't have any baseline data uh, pre, you know, really 1950. Um, and we, we'd settled Alberta in those times. Um, a large of lots of um, agricultural sediment, uh, settlement had, had occurred then. So we really don't have a good understanding of pre-disturbance baseline. So what we can do 
from here is just understand what what currently uh, water quality is and help those um, help use those to uh, set objectives, including um, using water quality guidelines established for um, parameters of concern or toxic parameters, and then for nutrients, starting to understand how these how these uh, systems function and then and set targets based on that. So. This is not a surprising story. As we move downstream, we have more and more organics being put into the watershed. Large, lots of that is uh, because of the surficial geology and the um, increase in wetlands and just the increase in forested areas as you move the down into the downstream areas. Certainly some of that can be partitioned out in terms of um, different types of land use, whether it's urban or agriculture. Um, but we would see a, a, this similar trend as we move downstream. And I kind of have stopped the graphs at White Mud because um, these are what we use for our source water protection plan. But it does highlight that maybe for color, uh, something that we use, uh, maybe something like Tomahawk Creek, particularly once we start to do the load allocation, how much uh, in the spring runoff period, which is a real challenge, how much uh, in terms of kilograms of a contaminant or a water quality parameter is coming from each of these streams and is it enough to affect concentrations and if, if we could mitigate that in the watershed through some BMP practices is that a good use of our resources and so this the data will start to help us answer those questions. When we look at sediment, we get a little bit of a different picture. And we've all been into our North Saskatchewan River Valley, uh, particularly as we move more into the downstream locations uh, throughout the city of Edmonton. And we see the big valleys. And the reason we see these big valleys is, um, you know, when we had the glacial Lake Edmonton and it slowly drained away, we have a lot of sediment that had been de deposited. And every time we get high flow events, we see these sediment pulses come back into our streams. Um, and we see that through the, all the, all the lower streams and even in some of the upper headwater streams, we're seeing sediment, high sediment and high erosion. And it's a natural, um, naturally high, uh, a sediment river for for this reason because we have um, large deposits of sediment on our banks and throughout our watershed so it's not surprising that we're seeing this these sediment fluxes and it's not necessarily a negative for uh, you know a fish species that had been adapted to a kind of a muddy bodied bottom river what we try to do now is say okay well is it changing through time? How will climate change um, impact this? Are we going to have greater flows, different runoff patterns, more ice scouring? And how will that will it affect sediment movement and sediment fluxes through time? And particularly when we have the on data where we can look at turbidity and link that to uh, total suspended sediment and, and have an idea of those fluxes through time. Um, and, and potentially, you know, some of those greater changes that we do see through time through forest fires, um, mountain pine beetle, and some of those greater watershed uh, perturbations, how that's linking. So all of this data is really helping us understand, again, that watershed science, and, and that will inform how we manage on the landscape. If we look at um, a microbial uh, parameter such as E. coli, we start to see, you know, in some cases, uh, we see the influence of um, agricultural land use and certainly in the, the urban environment, uh, White Mud Creek uh, is why we are putting this on a log scale because we've had numbers of, you know, 100,000 E. coli coming from the, from the from the sewer system. So we're seeing that, you know, we're starting to be able to paint the picture of where, um, for each parameter, what where it's where sources are in the watershed, and and that will help us manage at downstream locations such as where a maximum allowable loads are set up at can. So again, it's just understanding that science. And when I last kind of the last graph I'll show you is looking at a total phosphorus, which is an indicator of potential nutrient enrich enrichment in these streams. Again, if we looked at these, some of these stream systems post-human uh, settlement, we would probably have seen a lot of an increase in, in, in phosphorus as we move uh, downstream 
uh, in the watershed just due to uh, phosphorus being absorbed to sediment and sediment um, transport in these watersheds being a, an important function. Um, that said, you know, that the next step is once we know that we ha have high phosphorus in these systems, how is, how is it functioning within that system? Are these phosphorus limited systems? How can we set nutrient objectives to help manage um, excessive weed growth and all the things that are, are listed in our water quality guidelines? Um, and we do know that uh, in the upper watershed, we're not going to see as much nutrient enrichment because we simply don't have the biological mass on in these watersheds. It large, large, lots of them are, are rocky, lots of them are heavily forested. Um, we don't see as much uh, uh, runoff into these. Um, and the export uh, from these forested watersheds is a lot lower than in an agriculture watershed or an urban watershed. Um, so again, it's not a question of whether one stream is better than the other. It's just a question of understanding those processes, uh, where we are now, and helping to set objectives to meet our, our collective needs on each of these systems and uh, down through the through the North Saskatchewan River as a whole um, at the city of Edmonton at Pecan at the border um, each of those kind of uh, tells a story and paints a picture for 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 our area yeah. so I, I really only have two more slides here um, so I won't use up your whole lunch hour but the the uses of the watershed data and and these are big large bullet points but again they're really uh, this the, the watershed data is meant to be a long-term program to characterize how systems are functioning how these watersheds are functioning and 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 they're meant to be representative of the larger um, state of the North Saskatchewan uh, in terms of you know if, if one uh, agricultural watershed is sampled and understood it could generally be applicable to some of those other watersheds so what that will allow us to do is um, measure change through time under changing climate and land use. So if you have a continuous data set, you can understand what the drivers are in a dry year, a wet year. And once you understand that, you can say, okay, well, in wetter years, we're seeing these processes dominate in, in under climate change. We're expecting these change in melt conditions. So it's likely that we're going to see this change in water quality. And it will allow us to better manage our infrastructure say for example, from a water treatment plant um, and better understand uh, how, our, how our water, understanding where loads are originating for particular parameters will inform um, best management practice implementation and general management of our watersheds. If for example, uh, we find that color is originating from a certain type of watershed, we, but it's a very seasonal, or it's driven by a, a snowmelt patterns, um, there may be specific BMPs that are more um, uh, able to mitigate those, you know, uh, the implementation of wetlands versus manure management or, or whatever it may be. Once you understand how those watersheds are functioning, when that parameter moves through it, is it during spring runoff? Is it uh, a big flux when you have had several dry years in a row and then you of a wet year and it moves through, all that understanding will allow that uh, the management to increase. Um, the idea of the concept is you really have to have an understanding of load contributions and under the, a range of conditions to be able to put that into models and link land use, climate change, land cover, these other watershed processes to water quality and quantity. And we're getting there with the watershed program, but there's still work to do. Um, and and But that is, one of the end goals and the, and the uses is once we ha once we understand those processes, we can start to model it and we can see how changes to each of those parameters would affect um, the things we care about in the rest, such as aquatic ecosystem health. So I may have cut out there for a bit. No, we can hear you, Steph. You're just going to do so your So just let me know when you can hear me again. Okay. <laughs> so
At least it's the internet unstable, not me. Um, so highlighting, um, uh, again, highlighting the, these problem areas for enhanced management, and that has to do with uh, emerging contaminants. Again, we have a, a, a sampling for a suite of metals, but uh, one of the great things about the watershed program is that when there's emerging contaminants, because the sampling, the sampling times are all set up already, if you wanted to do a suite of pesticides, there would be samplers going out and sampling and, and um, you know, you can add that on and say, okay, we've raised this funding or we've got this funding from this organization. Uh, can we add these parameters of concern? Um, PFAS is from fire retardants is a very good example. There's lots of emerging contaminants that can be added to the program as they emerge through our, through our, our um, understanding of, of watershed drivers. And again, that, that basic determining a baseline of water quality and quality maximum allowable loads in the North Saskatchewan River, as well as potentially up into those small tributaries and those and um, and uh, those sub basins. So um, uh, and that's a discussion for each of the, the sub basin groups, but without the data, it's very difficult to understand. Uh, um, hey, Steph, we have about um, one minute for you to wind up. So in quick conclusion, that's good. I only have one minute to talk, so should be one minute. Uh, so again, data is useful when it's collected across the watershed, um, not just in specific areas, but for specific programs. Uh, and the program has to be ongoing. Um, Three years of data collection isn't enough to understand all those drivers. If you have three wet years, you're going to be missing some of those processes. Um, water quality and quantity assessment is complicated, so you really have to have a long-term monitoring program and that linkage um, and the way that the program is designed does that. Ultimately, the data is used to ensure that Water for Life goals are met, but each user, whether it's NSWA, APCOR, um, AAP, may use the data in a different way. Um, but the, and I'll leave you with, you know, watershed management is equally complex as watershed science, but it all starts with good data and good understanding. And so that's, that's all I have. Great. Thanks so much, Steph and uh, Christina, who we um, uh, had to run to another presentation. So um, very interesting project and really um, shows what you can do uh, when you do work in a partnership. So just to wind up, um, we do have uh, three more dates in our series, uh, the 10th, 17th and 24th, and you can sign up just on our uh, homepage. And um, uh, please let us know if you, uh, you enjoyed the webinar and if you had any suggestions for improvements. Um, and thank you so much uh, for joining us and we'll see you next time.